Hello and welcome everybody to the Film Music House here at Sundance 2021. Uh, so excited to have everybody here. Welcome, welcome. This is our next keynote speaker who we've been doing a series of keynotes here at Sundance that all focus on composers who have had outstanding films screen at the festival. And the person that is about to join me is no stranger to Sundance. In fact, she is probably one of the most people I associate Sundance with. Please join me, Miriam Cutler. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Great to see you. Nice to be here. Yeah. I we miss must the snow. Feel I feel so familiar, <laughs> you know, being at Sundance. Yes, I love it. It's been a really important part of my life and work. Absolutely. Um, for those of you who might not know, Miriam is a three-time Emmy-nominated composer for film and TV. Her passion for documentaries led her into focus on non-fiction storytelling, eventually becoming a staple in the documentary scene. Even The Hollywood Reporter crowned her the queen of doc music. Her credits include <laughs> RBG, Dark Money, Love Gilda, The Hunting Ground, and so many more. Um, Early in this festival, we had Jeff Beal on as a keynote speaker. In fact, he was day one keynote. And I told him how he is, I associate him with the festival a lot because he's had so many films, but one person eclipses him and that's you. You definitely are, when I think of Sundance, I think of you and Miriam Cutler oh, and all of the wow. amazing work you've screened <laughs> at the festival. So what does Sundance mean to you? Oh, well, I have to say, I mean, it really, the first time I went to Sundance was in 1997 and I went with my first really good documentary. It was called License to Kill with Arthur Dong. I had no idea that, that this community, this international community of, of filmmakers existed, you know, not, not for someone that I could, not in a way that I could have access to and be part of. And, uh, and so when, when I arrived, I knew nothing about it. And uh, the film was very successful. It won two awards and he took me around. I met so many people that have become my very closest friends and many of them my collaborators. And I think for me, what Sundance really means is community. Yeah. Who have yeah, you met at Sundance? That, oh my that God. Really I mean, well, of course, Arthur and, and um, Kate A. Mend and Lisa Lehman. And I mean, I, you know, I've met every single filmmaker that comes to Sundance. I mean, I've met most of the doc people. I haven't really circulated in the nonfiction, in the fiction area. Cause I, I've, you know, at least in the early years, for sure. Um, the documentaries were so much stronger <laughs> than the independent features. <laughs> now I think it's changed. I think things have really changed a lot and the docs have even gotten stronger and stronger. But um, my area of interest was, was the documentary community because I really was looking for a way to have a purposeful career, you know, not just to write music, but for me, I need a reason to do it. I need to feel like th that I'm part of something bigger, that I can maybe contribute in some small way to shining a light on important, important stories or issues, making changes and things like that. So for me, it was just, it was like finding heaven, you know, it really was. <laughs> Have you met a collaborator at the festival? Like where you first met them and then you later worked on a Oh, film yeah, together? several. But the, the one I think of the most is Kimberly Reed. When I first met her, she was just a, starting out. She hadn't made any films yet. And we met at one of my favorite things to do at Sundance is to attend the panels because that's where you really get a chance to interact and, and learn more about the behind the scenes aspects, you know. And um, I remember Kim came and sat down next to me at one of those panels. And we just started talking, you know, and then we really bonded. And over the years, I'd see her there every year. And then pretty soon we started becoming actually friends. And when she'd be in LA, she'd stay here. And then um, she made, you know, uh, Prodigal Sons, which was, it wasn't a Sundance film, but it really put her on the map. And then uh, when she started working on Dark Money, you know, we we got together, you know, I was able to help in the early stages and be involved as a co-producer. And so it was fantastic. And it did end up screening at Sundance, which was quite exciting. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah. You also are, uh, you're a mentor at the Composer Labs, or you have oh, been, yeah. rather. Um, what, is, what is the Composer Labs exactly? And, and what is the process of mentoring young composers like that? Well, it's, it's not necessarily young composers, but uh, I started doing it in, I think it was 2003, was the first year that they decided to include documentaries as a separate category in the Composer's Lab. 
So I did it. And so I've been with it from the very beginning when it, at first we were separate from fiction. Then we, then they started combining them. Then they separated them again. And in the old days, we used to do it on the mountain, which was at the um, resort, Sundance Resort. And it was much more focused on the filmmakers and then giving them a chance to interact and collaborate with composers. And then um, a few years ago, they moved it to Skywalker and they really started focusing on sound design and music. And it became much more, in some ways, you know, it changed from what it had been, which was kind of a really focusing on storytelling and not expecting to have a final product at the end of it. But when we moved to Skywalker, it changed and it became something to really sh um, illustrate to documentary filmmakers who hadn't necessarily been as focused on the craft part of sound and music as non as fiction were. And I think it started blowing their minds. You know, if you take a documentary composer who hasn't really thought much about music and you put them in the room with the string section while they're recording. And I think they start to understand the power of music in a whole new way. So that was really fun for me to, you know, it, it was even, even when we did it on the, at the resort on the hill, on the mountain, um, the filmmakers would kind of be amazed at how much, um, how much nuance there was in music, how much they were able to communicate. If they could communicate, they could basically tweak and turn a knob with the composers to get what they really wanted from the score instead of just settling. Oh, okay, that'll do. And I think it, you know, so the whole program has worked in two really important ways. One was, one was to really help filmmakers understand how to collaborate with a composer so they could really push the limits of the craft, you know. And then the other was to understand production of music and how, and sound and how much that can contribute to production value of your film and storytelling in every possible way. Like it's so much fun to sit there in the room when they're hearing it and they're just like you know, exploding, <laughs> their brains are exploding, little light bulbs are going off. And I think every, every filmmaker that's had the opportunity to be part of it has really been able to expand their um, view of how to use music. And the composers have also expanded their view of the filmmakers because now they're hanging out together, you know, everybody's screening each other's work and interacting. It's just a fantastic uh, environment where everyone is treated as if they're a very important artist. That's the beauty of Sundance. And, and so everyone really gets to focus on being their best and, and also trying, trying new things and pushing their own comfort zones. So like they always say, uh, Tabitha always says, you know, don't be afraid to fail. That's really why you're here is to fail because you're trying new things. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, for those watching that might not know, do you know how to apply for this, the, the Composer or Director's Lab or any of those? Oh, yeah. Concepts? Well, you have to go to the Sundance Institute website. And um, definitely, if you're in the Society of Composers and Lyricists, they usually have a call to action. I'm sure if you follow the Facebook page of Sundance Institute, they'll probably put out a call. But you can always go on their website and look for when, you know, I think you know, I can't remember when the dates are, but they usually have the workshops uh, in July or August. And uh, it's, it's kind of timed in a way where the films are kind of almost ready for the festival or the mm -hmm. festivals. Do any of them do go to the festival. Some of them, I mean, it doesn't, it's not a no, it's not a for sure just because you're in there, but, but it, you know, a lot of the film, well, the films that are in there are already having support from Sundance. So, but they don't necessarily get into the festival, but they have support from the Institute. And, um, and that's an incredibly, any time you can be involved with a Sundance program of any kind, I would say you owe it to yourself to apply and keep applying because, you know, I've known people that have applied nine times and they got in on the ninth time. So never mm -hmm. just, it's nothing personal as the same with the, with the festival. There's so many submissions that it's just really sometimes hard, you know, but if you just keep trying, you'll get there eventually. Right. And then, and then the part of your question about being an advisor um, so the, so Sundance is very artistically, the Institute is very artistically oriented and they're looking for, with the composers, they're not looking for somebody who can be the next John Williams. They're looking for someone who has some kind of voice, some kind of new, somebody as an artist that would, it's important to support and develop because they'll really bring something new or something unique to our profession or to the industry. And so being an advisor, my role mostly I find is to share certain things that I know can be helpful. I've learned, I've been doing this for like almost 30 years. I've done a lot of mistakes and I've 
learned a lot of stuff along the way. And so I love to share that, you know, some of the things I've learned. And I also like to really focus on how do they op open up to their own process? You know, I would never judge someone's music or tell them how to do it, but it's really, really exciting to help them understand and have confidence in their own ability to, um, to try something, you know, to really go for it and to keep at it and not be so concerned about, oh, what if the director doesn't like it? Well, you know, that's okay. They might not like anything, you know, but the point is for you to just really develop your ability to try things, to, to, to imagine something, be able to execute it, and then be able to discuss it in a meaningful way and take from that discussion the direction that you need to build on the ideas that work. And if none of them work, start over. <laughs> but, but you know, it's all, um, I learned a long time ago, this is about process. It's not about a goal. So if you wanna, uh, you know, if your goal is to get through it and everybody love you and think you're great, make a record, <laughs> you know. But if you wanna really go through a very deep collaborative creative process, then you have to be able to flow with that, you know, and it's, it's a really, it's very, very hard. It's complicated. There's personalities involved. Um, but, you know, if your heart's in the right place and you've got your chops, you know, then you can really work your way through it and, and, and have an amazing experience with other really creative people. That's amazing. Now you give, you give back to people all the time. You're always giving talks or being a mentor or, or whatnot and bestowing your knowledge as much as you're doing right now. <laughs> sharing, just sharing. Sharing, <laughs> sharing your knowledge. Um, and uh, I've had the great pleasure of going to multiple places around the planet with you to, <laughs> to travel and speak. And one of them that really stood out to me was we were in Cordoba in Spain. And you were talking at their music festival there, and it was a it was a panel workshop on music and documentaries. But really, what it was is a a lesson on following your passions and your dreams, and not yeah. mimicking what you think of is as success, but doing something that's truly meaningful to you. Do you like? Do you remember that this talk? And kind of do you could you kind of recap a little bit about what you're were trying to get up? You know what you're trying to impress on those students? Yeah, um, you know I think. Nobody wakes up in the morning and goes, oh boy, I want to land a really high paying gig and spend all day doing something I really don't like and write a bunch of music that I don't want anybody to know that I did. You know, and nobody, I mean, nobody that's kind of artistic. I think m most of us get up, like when we realized we wanted to be a musician, we tried to figure out a way to monetize it so that we could do it all the time. I, I think people that have that certain drive so when I was younger, you know, there was a lot of pressure. I always felt like there was a lot of pressure to be more mediocre, to blend in better, you know, and, and uh, I, I worked for about 10 years in the beginning and became solvent doing a lot of different things, a lot of um, industrials, bad movies and low budget horror movies and, you know, things that I, you know, I kept thinking, when it, is there going to be some moment when I know that I'm going to get out past this? And I realized I had a couple of humiliating experiences where my name was attached to something that I really didn't want people to know about. <laughs> and so I realized that, you know, it's not going to change unless I make a decision to turn that work down. And to, you know, I've got to, at this point, I'm going to just jump off the cliff. I'm either going to have this career or I'm not, you know? So I shut that door. And honestly, when I shut that door, all these other doors, they probably were always there. I just didn't see them because I was making money to live, you know? So I think musicians have a tendency to just be happy to get paid, you know, to do what we love. But I think we have to want more, you know, for ourselves. And uh, and so what I, what I like to share is how my journey of how I realized that it was all up to me to really um, envision for myself something more. And even though I didn't know what it was, I just kept scanning the, the horizon, you know, okay, I'll try this. Okay. I was very open, very flexible. I just tried lots of different things. But when I went to Sundance in 1997, bingo, that was it. I just realized this is it. This is what I've been looking for. And it took a really long time. You know, I was already like 15 years into my career, but at least I found it. And I've been, you know, the moment I found it, I knew exactly what I had to do is become part of that community and and you know, get to know everybody and learn more about how to do what they needed. And, and so um, I think 
Oh, wait, I, I think that what I used as a guide was when I was in my 30s and 40s, I would think, how am I going to feel when I'm 60 and I look back on my life? Am I going to feel good about my decisions that I made? And, and I every time I was kind of thinking about something or got tempted to do something that I knew was a step backwards, I'd think that and I'd go, I want to be proud. You know, I want to be happy and proud. <laughs> I know. Sorry, doorbell. I was not expecting that. <laughs> Somebody's in the theater with you. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that uh, I am now in my late 60s and I'm looking back on my life and I'm like really content. I feel like, you know, I struggled in the earlier years, but I really got to where I wanted to get to and everything that mattered to me has happened. You know, like I'm respected. I've done work that I'm so proud of and uh, and I have no regrets about any of it. So if you your your life has to matter, too. You know, it's not, I mean, some people, and we all have to find what matters to us. Like I have a pretty, I have my own bar of what matters to me and that I must achieve. Somebody might want to work on video games and that's like their passion. So that's fine, you know, but, it, but be passionate. Don't, don't mute your passion, discover more of it and go in those directions and let your, you know, I let my heart kind of guide me. I just went, oh my God, yes oh shit, no, you know? So, I mean, you know, pay attention to those things because someday you'll be old. <laughs> I'm wondering now if there's any filmmakers that are potentially watching in the audience, what sort of advice would you give to filmmakers who might be nervous about working with a, an established composer or working with a composer in general? Like um, what's some advice you would give to them about communicating? Oh, first of all, just know that the, the whole fact that you've, gotten it together to make a film. I mean, making music and um, producing it is, a, is hard and complicated and challenging financially in every other way. But making a film, that's even a, that's above, that's a harder. And so first of all, you know, you should be very proud of yourself. Know that most composers really respect that. And don't come into the relationship fearful. You know, there's lots of ways that you can learn to communicate with your composer and, and you don't need to know anything about music. All you need is your honest reaction to what you hear and how that relates to your storytelling, your narrative. And if it's if it's helping the feeling that you're trying to get or if it's interfering with it, you know, follow your own instincts about what's working. You're a you know, director, direct. And I also say, when you make a film, you work you generally work with an editor. So if you can work with an editor, you can work with a composer. You can talk to us in the same way you talk to your editor. And we, we because we are the ones, we'll translate that, put it through our, turn it into music process. You just need to be able to be clear about the purpose of the music, what you're hoping it will do for the film, you know, each cue, what it is, what's important emotionally, what's the emotional story. And because what's basically happening is you've got your, you've got your footage, your narrative, then you've got sound and then you've got music. Music is the emotional narrative of the film. So, it, you know, I always wanna make sure I'm telling the same story as the filmmaker. Um, that's what's really important is that my music is telling and reinforcing and supporting the story that you're telling. So as long as you can, um, you know, maneuver that, if, as long as you can stay in touch with, is it, is it, is it setting the right tone for what I'm trying to do here? That's all you need to know. And so when you talk to your film, your composer in the early stages, really talk about your film that way, like at this part, you know, like also break it down, you know, like I, I realized that um, filmmakers are in school, if they go to school and they're educated in filmmaking, they, they learn about three acts, you know, the, the structure of the three acts and maybe four acts, whatever. And so you can talk about sections of the film and this is what has to happen in this in this act, you know, act one, we meet the characters, we set up the problems. Act two, we delve into how they deal with the problems. And act three, aha, the happier, sad ending, you know. I mean, basically, there's only so many human narrative, you know, narratives. And so once we understand, oh, okay, how, and now it's like we tweak, you know, we get involved and go, well, how, you can say happy, sad, whatever, but within happy, sad, happy or sad, there's Happy goes all the way down to sort of happy to mildly happy, low expectations happy, you know, and then there's ecstatic. 
and there's all this stuff in between and that's the area that music helps with how happy is it is it really happy or is there a little bit of danger involved in the happiness is there a challenge involved is there heroics involved and sad you know is it like slit your wrist sad or is it oh whiny sad or you know so if you're clear about the purpose of your scene then you can explain that to your composer and the composer if they're paying attention will understand the nuances and then it becomes a matter of they have to just throw things at the wall and see is this it you know the other thing i would highly recommend is um a lot of um a lot of composers feel like they, the first cue they send has to be utterly out of the ballpark and so they work and work and work and work you know and maybe they'll do the first half hour or hour of the film before they send anything I've learned in my experience, it's better to go with my instincts at the beginning, send something as soon as I can to get some feedback. I mean, basically it could sound, I could use any instruments. I could, you know, we have to limit the possibilities. So, you know, once it's much easier to talk about music when there's something to listen to than it is in the abstract. I mean, you and I can have a whole conference. Oh yeah, the violins should do this. And the, you know, and I want, I want a trombone when that happens and okay. Let me put it together for you and you can hear it. That's how you find out. I mean, people have to hear it. And then they go, oh my God, the trombones are ridiculous here. You know, how about flute? You know, so it starts, um, my new rule of thumb is build on ideas that work. And the only way to find what's working is to start sending things as fast as I can. And then that gives me more time to write, you know, really good music. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have some questions coming in from the audience. And by the way, those of you watching, if you have questions, just use the Q&A prompt and I can ask Miriam um, while we're chatting here. One question is when composing for a documentary like Till Kingdom Come with either such outrageous or disturbing subject matter, do you ever <laughs> have to take a moment to take a breath and really process the footage you're seeing? Oh, very good question. It's a very interesting thing. Um, most artistic people or musicians are sensitive, you know, or at least many of us are, and we're emotionally sensitive. So uh, the, yeah, like there are things that are so sometimes hard to process. Um, so I have to remain really open to my feelings about things, but not so open that I've destroyed and can't work. Like I was working on Ghosts of Abu Ghraib and I would many, for a while I was working on this scene that included the torture stuff. And it was like every morning I'd come in and I'd be like, okay, I'm going to work. And then I'd turn it on and go, oh my God, the depths of humanity. And so you have to also calibrate and be able to regulate yourself in, when you're working. You know, um, we have to find a way to live with, working in documentaries is you, you really get involved in very powerful storytelling and sometimes the darkest of the dark of humanity, you know, um, and I think that you know, within that, we also have to be, we have to be able to self-regulate in, in our response to that emotionally, and also to be aware of what the purpose of the music is in that scene. So for instance, I may be feeling utter hopelessness and torment, and the filmmaker may say, Miriam, I need you to help us get through this really difficult section. I, I don't want to make it so hard to watch that people will turn off the film. So maybe my job is to just make it more neutral and put some energy behind what we're seeing to get to the next part so that people just don't, you know. So it's really important to be able to separate your own feelings about what you're doing and write this incredible, you know, sad, horrible piece of music that's, you know, you want to, you know, so, and then, but you have to be able to do what's needed for the film and separate your own emotions from it. So there's a couple different things going on of regulating so you're able to even work on it you know, and then the other part is making sure that you're telling the same story as the filmmaker in that moment. Of course. I hope that's helpful, you know. <laughs> I think so. Um, <laughs> now, you got to meet Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, the subject of RBG um, yeah. uh, at the Sundance Film Festival. So I, my question is, do you often get to meet the subjects of your film or was that just an, a wonderful rare opportunity? Well, first of all, I wouldn't call it got to meet her. I was adjacent to her <laughs> for a couple of days. You know, I mean, um, it's interesting. As they say, you know, at, when you're a fan of someone, don't meet them <laughs> because it's really not with her, but I mean, it's really nothing to do with what you love about them, you know, most of the time. 
Um, I have met a few people, you know, that I really admire that I've worked on films about like Robert Wilson or Terry Gilliam. They don't, it's like, they don't know who I am. I've been watching them. I may have even seen them naked, you know, but they don't know me. So I go, you know, I first I used to go, hi, I'm Miriam. I did the music. And they're like, huh? <laughs> you know. So I realized that just because I'm very enthusiastic about them, that doesn't mean that they won't care about meeting me. So I'm very respectful to people. I, I don't, you know, when I was around Ruth Bader Ginsburg, oh, I, I really wanted to just talk to her. But I could see that so many people want to talk to her. And, you know, I, she, was, she needed some downtime. And I could see, like, she literally, you could see her having downtime. And to walk up and interfere with that just felt really totally wrong to me. So I just enjoyed breathing her, the air she breathed for a little while and, and just yeah. knowing that I was able to help tell her story. And my God, I can't believe she's gone, but. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was a moment, I'm taking us back to Spain where we were at that festival. And for some reason that trip was super memorable to me because of a number of things. One, the panel that we discussed earlier, but two, you got a call or, or an alert, so to speak, that you were invited oh. to become a member of the Motion Picture Academy in the doctorate yeah. specifically. What was that like to get get that notification or that that invite just to say that they want you to be a part of the doc branch? Ah, <laughs> I'm so glad you were with me because it was one of the highlights of my entire life. I mean, come on, you know, um, to be that to be held in regard by your colleagues and peers. Um, is incredible, you know. So it was for me. It was the beginning of a new, a new chapter of my life of have realizing. I mean, I'm sure that I've been part of the community for a long time, but that was a moment where I realized that I was here to stay, and that they saw me that way, and um, that they respected me enough to make me part of it, you know. And so it was really something. I mean, it was kind of like. <gasps> I could die tomorrow and I've achieved what I was trying to achieve, you know. That's, yeah, it was a great moment. <laughs> I, rem I remember it, I remember it vividly. And um, I'm glad to hear that it was, it was a great chapter in your life where it oh, opened up. It continues to be, you know. And, yeah, yeah. to be accepted like that. Yeah. Um, some more questions that are coming in from the audience. Uh, what would you recommend aspiring doc composers to do to get started? Well, I think they should watch a lot of documentaries and see what the gig is. Uh, it's a little bit, you know, it's like film scoring and plus an added aspect because um, because the filmmakers in documentary, for the most part, are the profession itself adheres to journalistic ethics. And um, that's different than going doing whatever you want in the fiction world. Like you can really create any reality you want, but there are certain responsibilities in many or most documentaries. And the filmmakers are expected to be truthful, non-manipulative, you know, and honest, you know, just in their, in their approach. Uh, nobody, nothing is completely unsubjective, though there are those who would argue there is a way to do that, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a ongoing conversation in the doc community. But I think that um, because of that, there's a certain additional responsibility to how we how we use the music because it can be very music is completely I mean I do workshops where I show the same footage with five different cues that can make the story completely different you know it can make it dangerous happy clowny silly uh scary you know I can just a benign footage I can completely change the meaning and so it's very easy when you're scoring to get seduced by how beautiful and good the music is but it may not be what's right for that cue, you know, and you have to be able to go beyond your own musical desires and see what is your purpose there and be responsible about how you how you are able to to um, actualize the music that needs to be there for that purpose. I mean, every time I've and this is almost completely 100 percent. Every time I've been writing a score. And I wrote a cue that I think I'm just a genius. This is like the best thing I've ever done. Never fails, tossed. I just got really carried away with the music and it was not about the film anymore. And so, you know, I try to notice that better now. I'm not as, I don't do it as often, but it's really important to understand our role in film, in the film scoring, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
talk about a little bit about founding the Alliance for Women Film Composers. And I know that I was with you at the same yeah. time. I want you to talk about it from your perspective. What are your thoughts about, you know, the beginnings of it back in 2014 and where it's at now? Ah, oh, it's so, it's such a wonderful story about um, self-actualization for, for women composers. Um, so basically, you know, over the, I've been in BMI for since the seventies, you know, and, and I've been scoring since the late eighties. So I've been going to the BMI you know, film, film awards forever. And, you know, every, every year it was the same thing. I always see a lot of my friends, you know, guys, you know, they're all composers. They're all up there getting awards and there's like no women once in a while, a songwriter. Um, very rarely though. So in 2013, when we were in Spain, Doreen Ringer Ross, who was you know the head of film and TV at BMI, uh, did a panel which she put me and Rachel Portman on, and Beth Krakauer. God, may she rest in peace. Um, so, and what was this panel? Women composers. Because <laughs> <laughs> there was well, <laughs> there was two in the same room. How did that happen? Yeah, <laughs> like what else would we talk about? You know. So. Um, but and I and I remember I, I don't know Rachel very well. I only met her that one that one time and we hung out a little bit. But you know, it wasn't like her favorite thing to talk about. She had gotten an Academy Award. She didn't need to talk about it. And really, it was really uncomfortable and, uh, and unpleasant to talk about any of that. So most of us that were scoring, and at that time, I mean, Shirley Walker was before before me and I knew about her. Um, and then I knew, knew about uh, Laura Cartman. And then I, I learned about Lolita. So the, the three of us would be in the room at BMI, you know, during the awards going, hi, you know, and there were a few other people um, that were Nan Schwartz, of course, the great Nan Schwartz. Um, and so, you know, it was so like, when you're the only, when there's just a few of you, and this is really true of women in every area of life, we just don't want to, please don't make it about me being a woman. I just want to be, you know, I'm a composer. And so the last thing you want to do is get on a panel in public and talk about your feelings about what it's like to be a woman composer. <laughs> but I also realized also during the time when I was kind of rising a little more and getting interviewed and but about things, it always, always, every panel, every interview, what's it like to be a woman composer? And so it was mostly annoying. And then Laura and Lily that I would go, rrr, rrr, rrr. I always get this question, you know? <laughs> and so then one day I just said, I'm going to try to think of something I, they're going to ask it. I'm going to try to have something to say about it. It's, it's interesting. And so between that happening and then the panel we did, uh, after the panel in Spain, Doreen and I had dinner and we were talking about it because it was a really successful panel and there was, it was packed, probably because of Rachel, but everybody was really interested and they were asking a lot of interesting questions, you know, and, um, and so we both kind of looked at each other and were like, I don't know, maybe is there something we could do about this? It's really weird. And so she uh, offered to host a cocktail party and invite a bunch of women in the business, not just composers, but music supervisors, songwriters, you know, and from ASCAP and BMI. And so we had this cocktail party <laughs> and all of us were in this room looking at each other like, I've never even seen or heard of you. Like, <laughs> how could that be? And so we were in this room and we started talking and then we decided to have a luncheon, you know, for the BMI writers. And so, then at the luncheon, it was a lot more, it was a lot more intimate. There were maybe 20 people or something. And we had this lunch in this private conference room. And she asked us to tell stories about our experiences as women in this field. And it was, it was really illuminating. I mean, people were getting sexually accosted. People were, you know, scared to say anything about that. People mm -hmm. were being completely excluded from opportunities when they found out they were a woman. I mean, it was really unbelievable. I mean, because I've always just been in my own world and that's the way most composers are. We're kind of in our own world. Don't think about the community much. That's changed a lot. But in the beginning, you know, you just don't want to make any noise, you know. So um, so at that luncheon, we were all like, oh, now we really have to do something. So Laura and Lolita were there, of course. And Laura is so bold. Like I'm always kind of quietly behind the scenes, you know, and I'm mentoring and being all nice, but she's very bold. And so she had a lot of thoughts about it. And we decided to form a group and we called a bunch of people, you know, and got together and started talking and it built from there. But what I can tell you is magnificent about it is the young women have taken over. 
I mean, I, you know, I never wanted to run an organization, but I love what we do with it. You know, what we've, what's allowed, what's been happening with the Alliance is we started with mentoring, the, we used ourselves as mentors and tried to create the kind of opportunities that young guys have when they come out of school. They go beeline right for the assistant jobs with very big composers and they get lots of experience, whatever. And so we were trying to offer women that possibility and boy, was their interest because basically when you look at, you know, it's like when we started doing research and looking at the numbers, it's not like we're whining when we say there need to be more women composers. I mean, they're literally 1% of all, you know, studio released films are done by women. And that hasn't really changed much when sometimes it's 2%, you know, television is doing better now, but the Alliance has become a, a well-respected, just like the SCL, you know, and people come to the president and ask her for her opinion about things. And we're having a voice in this discussion. And it, it didn't hurt that right at that same time, you know, Oscars So White was happening. You know, you know there was just all, all these people were noticing. And there was a lot of public shaming of Hollywood and the entertainment business going on. And lots of new studies coming out of like how few, like women director has less of a chance of, than of, my, being, of being a coal miner more of a chance of wait less of she could be a coal miner before she could be a director you know something like that i mean it was like wow we're not whining this is just the way it is you know so between the all these things happening what we have now is a situation where in television we've seen a real change we've seen the studios opening up and offering apprenticeships mentorships we've seen lots of big time male composers opening opportunities to mentor and hire younger women or, or women that are coming into the field. Um, and so it's tremendous and we still have lots of work to do, but it's been amazing. And the interest by the young, the younger women, you know, I, don't, I mean, when I say younger, I'm in my sixties, you know, I'm talking about people that are starting or mid career even. Um, it gives them way more opportunities to go for more, more jobs, you know, than ever existed for me. I feel like I've been, out there with a machete making a path, you know, but I don't mind because I got where I wanted to go and I'm, I'm just looking for something very specific. Right. Um, and I think that people who want to have a career in as a film composer may not be that specific in the beginning until they discover what their passion might be. So I just say, um, take advantage. If you're a woman, join the SCL and the AWFC, everybody should be in the SCL because it is our premier, um, the group they lobby in 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 Congress for for league you know for uh, new legislation to protect our rights and also to protect our our royalties and um, and that's something else I really want to say is that you know it's wonderful to master your recording gear and be able to write music but if you can't cr come up with a a, mo a business model that's sustainable you won't be able to do it very long. So you must develop that part of yourself. If you're gonna be a lead composer, you must develop your entrepreneurial side and figure out where the opportunities are, how you can monetize it, and, and also become involved in, in the struggle to protect our copyrights and our, and our performance royalties. That's, that's a big part of how my business model became owning my own music and then uh, getting a, at least a third to half my income from the back end of that and because of that, I've been able to, you know, use live musicians and not have to live on my music budget. So that's a lot. And I know I've saying a lot, but <laughs> no, it's great. Very important it's, all, it's, to me. <laughs> it's all great. It's all great information. And I think really important. And unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, oh, but there sorry. is, there is there, so I, I apologize for those of you who, um, whose questions I didn't get to in the Q&A, but um, the one that I do want to ask is what is one of your favorite Sundance memories? Oh, my God. oh okay. I think uh, there were two. Uh, one of them, the first one was when Ethel premiered at Sundance in the giant theater. And and I thought having 25 Kennedys there for the screening was going to be big, but then Taylor Swift showed up because at that time she was really into Ethel Kennedy. <laughs> and so I was sitting way in the back of the theater. And I just remember at the very end, it was just like, that was a very hard score. It was really hard to get it right and stuff. And I had, I had worked very hard on it and I was like just completely <sighs> spent. And then I go to Sundance and I, and the end comes on and the end credits are playing and the audience just 
jumps up on their feet and claps for like 10 minutes, you know? I mean, it was like, oh my God, this is so incredible. And then the second one, I mean, there's so many, but then another one like that was Dark Money, which was a real heart project for me. Mm -hmm. I was really involved with it. And um, we, we got to screen it in this great venue with incredible speakers. And, and Kara Meritis was sitting right behind me and Kate was sitting behind me. And Kara was one of the funders, the Ford Foundation was one of the funders of the film. And, and uh, they were sitting behind me and, and at the end, everybody was roaring and Kara just patted me on the head. You know, <laughs> it, was like, <laughs> it was just so great, you know, because when, you, when you're able to manifest something that you're so passionate about, uh, it, it just, you know, it's just like, oh, yeah, I'm a puppy. Okay. We're all puppies, you know. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, well, again, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me uh, here at the Film Music House at Sundance Film Festival. Oh, uh, you've had fun. an amazing career, especially with Sundance. And so I really look forward to when we all get to go back to Park City and hang out. <sighs> me too. Me too. <laughs> thank you so all much. Right. I, hope, I hope everyone enjoyed it. You know, it's fun. Oh, yeah, no, we have great audience, great audience questions. Thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. Really appreciate it. We have Rob Simonson tomorrow, 4 p.m. Oh, Pacific great. Time. So please tune in and join us again uh, for our live keynote. Um, anyways, well, take care, Miriam, and I'm sure I'll Bye, see you Chandler. soon. Bye, Chandler. <laughs> Bye. Bye.